So let's go ahead and talk about some accounting principles and some of the key things you need to learn. The very first thing is the accounting equation. I have already alluded to this equation, but now we are going to explore it just a little bit more. The accounting equation basically states that the assets need to equal the liabilities plus the equity. So when you look at the balance sheet, the assets must always, 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 always equal liabilities plus equity. There's no exceptions. It must balance out. That is why it's called a balance sheet, a balance sheet, because assets equal liabilities plus equity. So that is one of the key concepts. That is one of the most important concepts you need to know is that assets must equal liabilities plus equity. Now, one of the reasons it's important to remember that is when we are looking at financial statements and we start to model out the financial statements, which we won't do in this course, but we do in our financial modeling course, it's a great check to know if you are doing things correctly. If you create a whole financial model and your balance sheet doesn't balance, well, then your whole model is wrong and something is screwed up. So it's a good check to know. But this is a fundamental principle you need to remember. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. Easy, right? Like I said, this is super easy stuff that we're learning. Nothing too crazy. So that's principle number one, the accounting equation. So let's go through an example. Now we are gonna jump into a case study in just a little bit and we will actually analyze the financial statements. But here are the financial statements that we are gonna be looking at in just a little bit. We have this company, it's called Food and Stuff. If any of you guys are parks and recreation fans, Food and Stuff. Uh, Food and Stuff, here are their financial statements. Obviously not their real financial statements, but you know, financial statements that we made up. So right here, we have all of their assets and we'll go through each of these accounts in a little bit. And we have total assets of $94 million in 2017. Well, down below, we have their liabilities, which consists of accounts payable and debt and things like that. And then we have their stockholders equity for a total of $94.1 million in liabilities and stockholders equity. So when you add up this 55 million right here, plus this 39 million, you get this 94 million. And this number right here matches this number up here. So assets equal liabilities plus equity. It's true always. It's never not true. And if it's not true, that means something's wrong. That means you need to go back and tweak your model or do something because something's not right. But assets must always equal liabilities plus equity. So that's the very first fundamental thing you need to know about the financial statements. The next thing we need to know is double entry accounting. Now you might be thinking, ah, oh, Nate, you said this wasn't gonna be difficult. Here you are talking about double entry accounting. That sounds pretty crazy to me. It's not, let's break it down. Double entry accounting, all it means is every transaction that a company does involves at least two or more accounts. Well, I guess not at least two. It involves two or more accounts, that's better. So every transaction involves two or more accounts. So let me show you guys an example of what I mean. Let's say that you borrowed $25,000 from the bank. That means that your cash account, which is on the assets on the balance sheet, is gonna increase by 25,000. And your notes payable, which is debt, or that's a liability, is also going to increase by 25,000. Now what that does is it balances out the balance sheet. You see what happened? We increase assets by 25,000 and then we increase liabilities by 25,000. So it sort of nets out, right? One increase and so did the other. So the accounting equation balances and it's all good. There's peace and harmony in the universe. So cash goes up by 25,000 notes payable or debt or whatever you want to call it also increased by 25,000. So the balance sheet still balances. Like I said before, it's two or more accounts are always affected by every single transaction. So let's look at an example of where three accounts are affected by a single transaction. So let's say that you had revenue of $75,000 last year. Okay. So you sold your product. Let's say you sell 
subscriptions to MySpace or you're like a MySpace consultant or a Google Plus consultant and you sell $75,000 worth of services and you've been paid $50,000. So your grandma paid you $50,000 to teach her how to use MySpace and then there's $25,000 that's still outstanding. So you've performed the work worth $75,000 You've received $50,000, but there's still $25,000 that people still owe you. So you would record $50,000 in cash because that's what you received. You would also record $25,000 in accounts receivable because you've received $50,000 and you expect another $25,000 to come in the next couple of weeks or so. So those are both assets. So assets just increase by 75,000. Well, you'd also record 75,000 in retained earnings or stockholders equity. Now we'll go through this in a little bit, but within stockholders equity is where we put the net income. So that's how the balance sheet and the income statement tie together is you take your net income and you plop it at the bottom of the balance sheet in retained earnings is what we call it. And so we would put $75,000 in retained earnings. So cash goes up by 50,000. Accounts receivable go up by 25,000. And retained earnings go up by 75,000. Therefore, there is peace and harmony in the universe. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. We increase assets by 75,000. And we increase retained earnings by 75,000. So that's the second principle. Every time you have one single transaction, it's going to affect at least two other accounts. Now, this is extremely beneficial, once again, when you are modeling the financial statements. Because if you show an increase in revenue, well, then you better be showing how retained earnings are increasing and how much cash you're receiving and the accounts receivable. You have to think about all these different pieces. So you can't just say, revenue increases by 75,000 and then just leave it. No, your model needs to be dynamic enough to flow to every other piece of the model. And once again, we don't go through that in this course, we'll go through that in financial modeling, but it's a core principle you need to know is double entry accounting. All right, let's talk about the third principle. The third principle is cash versus accrual accounting. So let's go through each of these. Cash accounting, is when you record revenues and expenses when you actually receive them or when they are spent. And really only small companies use this method due to the ease of calculating revenues and expenses. So if I'm just a small mom and pop shop or I just own like an Etsy business or I kind of just do some gigs on the side, well, then I would just record those revenues as they came in, like as someone actually sent me a check and then I'd record expenses whenever I actually spent money. So you don't get credit for money you haven't received and you don't have to pay or you know take credit, I guess, for money you haven't spent already. So here's an example. Let's say you do $25,000 of work in 2017 and you send invoices to all of your customers. Well, of all of these invoices, you only receive $15,000 in cash or check or whatever. And the remaining 10,000 is still outstanding. Well, based on cash accounting, your income for 2017 would only be $15,000, the actual cash you received. It would not be the 25,000. So for tax purposes, you would only show $15,000 in revenue, not the 25,000. So that is cash accounting. You only record things when you've actually received them or when you've spent them. Now that is opposite of accrual accounting. In accrual accounting, revenues and expenses are recorded when they are incurred. Now that is a new word, incurred, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But basically, larger companies use this method to normalize earnings and to give a more accurate picture of the company. Because if you're a larger company, you probably have banks that you need to report to or shareholders or investors or whatever, and you need to give them a more accurate overview of the company. You don't want to just show the money that you've received and that you've spent. You want to normalize everything and give a fuller picture of the company. So let me give you an example. 
let's suppose we go back to the example we used before where you had $25,000 of work in 2017, you send out your invoices and you receive 15,000 and 10,000 is still outstanding. Well, your income for 2017 would be the full 25,000. So you can see how it gives a better picture of the company. If you had to report cash, well then people might be like, oh, you only did $15,000 in revenue? You're like, no, 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 like I did a lot more, I promise, and they're like, well, how come your income statement doesn't show that? Well, doing the accrual accounting, you have already earned that money. And because you have already earned that money, you can count it as revenue. Now, that 10000 that's still outstanding, that will go into accounts receivable, but you can record the full 25000 to report to people, and that's totally cool. So once again, it just gives you a better view of what has happened at the company. Now, this also applies to expenses. We have been talking about revenues, but it also applies to expenses. And so we can accrue expenses as they are incurred. So let's say that you buy a big machine and the machine costs you $1 million. Well, under the cash accounting method, we'd have to show that $1 million in expenses right on day one. And that can make a massive hole in your income statement. You might show investors, hey, I'm sorry, but we lost $1 million this year. And they're like, whoa, $1 million, what the heck happened? But in reality, you bought that machine, but that machine is gonna last you, let's say five, 10 years. And so under the accrual accounting method, we can actually spread out that expense over the 10 years as that expense is incurred basically. So you buy a $1 million piece of equipment. So let's just say the machine is expected to last 10 years. Well, you take $1 million divided by 10. Well, then every year you would recognize $100,000 in expenses. So you take the 1 million divided by, let's say 10 years, let's say that's like the useful life of this machine, and you get to 100,000. So we'd expense $100,000 every single year instead of putting all that expense all in year one. So once again, it sort of normalizes earnings. It makes it a little bit more realistic, it makes it, gives it a more realistic view of the company's earnings. And so that's what cash versus accrual accounting. Now that's very important to remember because once we start analyzing the financial statements, when we start talking about depreciation and things like that, we need to understand this concept because then it'll help us better understand when we are trying to back out different items on the financial statements to get to different metrics.